Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. Pioneer life was tough all around. In Florida in the 1830s and 40s, it was doubly hard because the U.S. government was at war with the Seminole Indians and the pioneers lived in the same grounds as the Seminoles. Eventually, the soldiers left and the pioneers themselves were called upon to defend their lands and themselves. Defending the home, however, fell to the matriarch back on the homestead. That became just one more task for the women of the time. In addition, they cooked and cleaned and spun and sewed and washed and raised the children. How did they do it all? What did they wear and why? When a drunken husband would irresponsibly drink all their savings away. Some took to the good book. Others joined temperance movements, the 1830s being the time of the greatest per capita consumption of alcohol in the nation's history. Joining us to explain the role of women in Florida Pioneer Society is Brigitte Stevenson, curator of the City of Sanford Museum. She's an expert in clothing and social mores of the era. You can even see Brigitte decked out in 1830s attire as she is a living history demonstrator. Brigitte Stevenson, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited to talk. I know Bennett Lloyd, he forwarded uh, your information and was like, you should do this. So he's been kind of hyping me up in the background because he works at the other museum. I work at the Sanford Museum and he works at the Museum of Seminole County History. Even though we work at two different institutions, we frequently work together. And recently I helped him out with his Battle of Camp Monroe encampment that was held over there. And I I did the whole thing. I dressed up in my 1830s kit and discussed what kind of interesting, almost, I would argue, privileges that white women had during the kind of frontier days in Florida and what reasons they had those quote-unquote privileges. Brigitte, well, excellent. So please tell us about life for women in Florida in the 1830s. Start with what they wore. Yeah, so I'm a big proponent that our ancestors weren't stupid, and the clothing is surprisingly more comfortable than you would believe. I have a background in historical sewing and costuming, and the 1830s is a time period that I really love because it's kind of a wacky time period in woman's fashion. It's really this in-between Regency era, and then you have the 1860s hoop skirt era. So you see this transitionary period where you're starting to get bigger and bigger skirts, and you're getting bigger and bigger sleeves and that waistline is dropping. So it's not terribly uncomfortable. You're wearing something that's not like the corset that you have later on, which I would argue a corset is more comfortable than most people think. You just have to get it fitted right to your body. But I'm wearing something called a corded stay, which would involve a bust and cording. Cording could have been done with yarn or reed or anything of that nature. So it's not as stiff as the stays of the late 18th century. It is a little bit more maneuverable of that time period, but you still have a wooden busk. Like, I'm not going to be able to curve my back as easily with it, but it does give me great posture <laughs> more than anything. And there's, I was about to go on a whole history rant about fashion. <laughs> We're here. Yeah, so one of the things that we tend to forget, especially with modern fabric, is a lot of the modern fabric that we have is made with polyester, and that's a plastic. The resources that our ancestors had was going to be more natural fibers. And the good thing about natural fibers is really good at quicking, so they'll absorb your sweat and kind of cool you off. And the way that women did this is they would have a, your first leg would be something called a chemise or a shift. Chemise is the French word, shift is the English word. And then you would put your corded stay over on top of that. And that allowed all your sweat, it basically acted as deodorant, as like antiperspirant as well, to absorb your sweat and then keep it near you to cool your body. The hardest part about wearing an outfit is it's going to be the petticoat. Because at this time period, you're wearing a corded petticoat to give more volume and probably at least three other 
petticoats as well to give it the shape that you want. And those petticoats kind of get in the way. Like if you get it wet, it's awful. That's something that's a little bit interesting. And that's why when the hoop skirt came in the 1860s, so many women found it liberating because they didn't have to wear as many petticoats as much. You can comfortably work in an 1830s dress, surprisingly. What worries you about wearing the old attire? If I'm at Bennett's encampment and I'm by the fire because it's also really flammable material as well. So that's my biggest fear whenever I'm wearing the outfit, but it's not anything in regards to heat stroke. It's mainly in regards to I am not comfortable enough with a fire yet, <laughs> which these women by birth, they would have been, not by birth, but fairly early in their age, they'd be knowing how to tend to fire and such, where that's not as much of a, of a problem really. What were the popular and the accessible fabrics? Linen was big. Cotton's really big, especially it's starting to happen in the United States. And then the economy is starting to shift to cotton in the South eventually because desire for cotton all over the world was so heavy. That was a big thing. But linen and wool, usually wool was actually cheaper at that time period. So it's interesting to, whenever I am making an outfit, I can always have to curse to myself because wool is one of the most expensive fibers out on the market right now, when in the past it was much cheaper. That's one of those things that's interesting how it's flipped, like how lobster used to be considered a poor man's food, and that's not the case anymore. <laughs> but same thing goes with fibers, and that's really just what's the labor and how much access that we have to it. Because anyone could own sheep and then spin the fiber themselves and be making their own fabric. Some of these women, especially if you're a pioneer, you were expected to know how to do these things and spin your own wool and weave your own fabric itself and, and make your own dresses. What's the difference between some of these fabrics? The plant cotton will create this little fluffy thing to keep the seeds, and that's where cotton comes from. And then linen comes from flax, and that's a pretty labor-intensive process to get that out, too, because you have to, like, submerse the flax in water, I believe, and then take it out and let it dry. And then you have to, like, use this looks like a medieval torture device to break down the fibers to get the actual stringy, thready part. And then you have to – a lot of these uh, fibers – took an immense amount of time to process to even get it to where there's a proper term for it like when it's just unspun fiber and then you would spin it yourself a lot of people don't think of that they think of point a and point b they think oh well you share it maybe you clean it and then you spin it but there's a lot more to that process than most people realize and i'm sure there's some of you who are listening that may have spun your own wool or do fiber arts and you're just like nodding in, in, in the back or like oh my gosh because <laughs> uh, there, there is there's a lot to this process and we tend not to, to think about that with clothing because we're in the age of fast fashion you can just go on amazon and and buy a dress for twenty dollars and think nothing of it but you have to remember that many people didn't have access to that fast fashion and the clothing that you would have would last you for years and you would have to know how to fix it and mend it or even how to alter it to make it into the most modern of fashions. One of the things that I always find interesting in the museum world, uh, especially when it comes to textiles, is how the 1860s, we don't have a lot of skirts. We have a lot of the bodice. But all that yardage of a skirt from the 1860s was used to make other pieces of clothing later on because you wanted to reuse what you had if it was good. And once those big voluminous skirts weren't used, weren't as popular, that's a lot of yardage you can use to make something beautiful. And in the 1830s, you actually kind of see something similar with the sleeve. And 1833, you really get the, what's called the leg of mutton or the gago sleeves. They look like these giant balloon-like sleeves, and they actually used what I like to call my little swim puffies. But they were these puffers, these undergarments that you would put to the shape of that giant sleeve in that time period. And what you start seeing happening in the la later part of the decade, in the 18, late 1830s and early 1840s, is that that volume starts going lower and lower on the sleeve area, like it's not as high up. And people are basically kind of playing around with pleating and decoration 
construction and that sort of thing to change the shape of this, but it's still the same fabric from the early part of the 1830s. So it's just one of those interesting how fashion changes and makes sense with the materials that people had and how ready people are able to consume that style dictates what's popular. That and also the Parisian fashion plates are eventually coming over and people want to be like how it is in France. <laughs> I always heard the statistic, and I may be wrong with this, that most people had like three dresses, three outfits. And one of the reasons behind that is because undergarments that you have, all those layers of petticoats and that chemise and stuff, that's the stuff you're regularly washing. That outer area, unless you're getting it dirty, you don't need to wash it as much because it's not directly at times touching skin because all these layers. You would occasionally want to wash it. <laughs> like it's not like, oh no, never wash it. But it allowed you the opportunity to wear the same dress over and over again, especially if you have an apron. And you see actually decorative aprons coming into fashion in the 1830s. There's a great book that's called The Workwoman's Guide. I saw one review saying it teaches you everything of how to be a woman in a little book. But what's great is it talks about how to make your own apron and what style, like what class of people are wearing these outfits or what's a good outfit to make for your servant, what's a good cap that you need to make for your servant and so on and so forth. Um, and it's a really a great directional guide of A, showing what different classes of people are wearing, but also just how to make those, those items. I've made a couple, I think I've made a hat, uh, like a bonnet from the Workwoman's Guide, an apron, and part of a bodice using it. And I just have to laugh because you're using math at that. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, why is the pattern maker better at math than I am? I have to always kind of call my friend that's better at math. But can you please help me do pattern math? Uh, please. I'm not great at that. But I'm better in history. <laughs> I always find that interesting that our ancestors aren't stupid. They were using mathematics. They were using these things to help with their everyday lives more than honestly sometimes we do. Luckily, we have calculators to help us out. <laughs> How did one decide which of these fabrics to use? One part is just knowing what type of cloth you want. You want with cloth, there's the fiber content, which is your wool, your cotton, your linen. And then you also have your weave. So you have twill, and that's the style of weave. You have satin or sateen um, with a type of weave. And all these dictate how strong it's going to be. You need to realize on the loom when you're going to do that. A lot of the times, again, your outer garments are being protected. I've seen in the Workwoman's Guide a direction of these things to basically guard your sleeve that you would put on over when you were doing work. Aprons were huge because when you were doing work, you could just, your apron was the thing to get dirty. You wanted materials that were pretty strong. And back then, most, like when we get like cotton broadcloth today, it's it's not how it was in the past. It's a little bit more sturdier than it was in the past how it was created. So a lot of the materials that, especially if you're doing green acting or living history, this is, you can never be 100% historically accurate because some of the weaves are just not done anymore. They're not done to that standard or that quality unless you want to make it yourself. Any of your listeners want to try to take that challenge on, that's always a delight. The other thing is just how you sew it, the construction of the garment. Certain stitches, because remember, this is before the sewing machine really took off. So you're hand sewing, making these outfits. And in fact, one of the dresses, I had a dress that I wore at the Second Bennett's encampment that was completely hand sewn because I was crazy and I wanted the challenge of it. So with that, I looked at techniques, looked at the different types of, of hand sewing techniques that you would have to do in order to make these sturdy garments. And one of these ways is by back stitching. So instead of just doing a in and out, in and out stitch, you would go back every stitch to do it. It's more laborious, but it makes a stronger garment. And that's really important because you don't want to be fixing it every day at the end of the night after a hard day. These are all important techniques to make a garment that's going to last you a while. There's an excellent book. It's called Making Working Woman's Costume, Patterns and Clothes from the Mid-15th Century to Mid-20th Century from Elizabeth Friendship. It's an excellent book, especially if you are a woman who wants to depict somebody in the working class, and it goes through everything, all your pieces that you would need, and the diagrams and where she found this. And and you would also have clothing, depending on what class you were, that have a little bit more similarities to some 18th centuries. Like you see the bed gown, that's 
still in use by the 1830s, especially with the working class, because it's so easy that you can put it on and start working compared to the dresses and bodices that are coming more and more fashionable. And so as you start having the Industrial Revolution making more fabrics easier and easier to get, more and more people are being, quote unquote, more trendy, if that makes sense. And so you have to find ways, of course, upper class has to find ways to make it more and more difficult to be trendy so they can show that they have wealth. One of my favorite things, and this is mainly seen in Europe, there was a term for a woman who was a working class woman who would hang around and be a kept woman to college students and then later on an artist called a grisette. And the reason why they got that name is because of Greece, which is gray and French, and because gray fabric was the cheaper fabric. So they would make these dresses that were very on trend and very on passe, but they would make it out of gray fabric. <laughs> and so this was, I, I always found that an interesting kind of example of how women were kind of being like, how do I stay on trend? How do I do that? What do I have to forfeit in order to have that happen? Today, unfortunately, it's somewhere way that we want to be on trend because it gives women, society still thinks looks are very, very important for women. And that was the same way in the past. And you can gain some power by looking your best. (laughs) That's why fashion is incredibly important, even to this day of dictating who you are and how you can raise above your station is another thing. I presume one's access to these great fashions and fabrics depended on where you lived in Florida. Yeah, yes, yeah, huge. Because you're in an area, your resources are not going to be as much. And you also have to talk about where in Florida you're settling. Because the peninsula is going to be the main areas. You have Pensacola, St. Augustine, and the up-and-coming Tallahassee, <laughs> which is kind of a sort of blue area. And Tallahassee eventually gets a lot of cotton plantations they grow in the area and stuff. So you're going to have more available cotton. But you're also having probably things shipping to St. Augustine. And Tampa even, I've seen a couple of articles discussing Tampa in the 1830s. So these kind of ports would bring in other fibers and other goods, and that's going to raise the cost. You can't have it. So if there was a way for you, if you had a farm, then wool is going to be a good bet for you. But it's hard because you have to share them. I don't really know how well sheep do in Florida, in all honesty. (laughs) And that's something I have to kind of think about. Florida specifically, we get cotton and really up in the north part, but I don't know with other areas how... I would have to kind of look at at roles and lists of how much things were being made. Because if you're somebody who is out trying to homestead, eventually homestead or go in an area that isn't as populated, make a farm and try to be the dream, which was a lot of people in Florida, which is have that plantation lifestyle, then it's going to be harder for you to get access to materials. And what are you, you're probably making your own fibers, but with what cotton or wool, I'd imagine linen would be very difficult to, to get access to, but I may be wrong in that. So if somebody knows, I would love to know the answer to that. That's something that I probably need to add to my research. Florida is also, it's very hard to get to point A and point B, depending on what person. If you're staying in one of the the cities, I imagine that would be the case. But if you're trying to make some, a life of yourself, especially with this idea of plantation gentry that you would have in the more middle part of the state, you're definitely going to have to travel more than you would ever expect. How did the legacy Spanish laws affect women in Florida in ways they didn't in other states? Women had this very interesting thing in Florida that we were one of the first states to allow married women to have their own property. One of the reasons behind that exactly staying put (laughs) is the main thesis because Florida is a colony at this time and they want people to come down and settle and they want what their ideal person is to settle there. You see all these things, especially done by the United States, that originally there were some loopholes and then the United States added more protection in order to get women to settle because at this time, the woman's realm is the home, the domestic realm. And so it can be argued what is more dangerous to the Seminole, the man who is stationed here and is going to fight a battle and then go back home? Or is it the woman who's going to make a house and stay on their land and do what society expects them to, which is make a home and stay 
huh. And that's important when it comes to the Seminole Wars to understand. You hear these stories of the Seminoles killing the men, women, and children. It's absolutely horrific. I, I, I'm not trying to say, like, no one's good <laughs> in this story. The reason why isn't because they're horrible people. It's because that's a direct threat to have this colonization happening on their land with these, especially white women, who were given more privileges and more civil liberties. It's not like they're listening to the early feminist groups up in Boston. <laughs> in New England, this is done for a practice. <laughs> America is such a diverse, the joke is like, it's a bunch of states in a trench coat calling itself a country. And it's even more so <laughs> in this time period. Each state has its own identity. And not only that, Florida is interesting because we were back and forth. We, what is it? The seven flags of St. Augustine. And we're already an anomaly <laughs> at this point when we be, become a colony of the United States. When I was talking about married woman having the right to own property, just to kind of explain a little bit, before in the past, the moment you marry, all of your property becomes your husband's property. Florida didn't necessarily have that. Florida had it where due to Spanish land laws and property laws, because in Spain, you inherit from both sides of the family, which is why a lot of Spanish last names have both the maiden name and the surname in it, which shows, and usually at this time, woman, it wasn't like, oh, they're amassing vast amount of property. For the most time, like your husband would take care of it once you got married. And it was really mainly for your descendants, your children, especially male children that would get access to both sides of the family's inheritance. But what happens, especially when America comes in and they keep all these laws, they notice that, especially in divorce cases, because Catholic Spain really did not like divorce. America was, I don't want to be like, it was okay with divorce. It was just easier to get than, than Spanish place that was under Spanish rule. So they see that woman discovering, oh, I can't. I can't own property because it's technically under my name. And if you got married, I think it's like half of your property. You could come with property before your marriage and that would be considered your own. Once you got married, you and your husband started amassing property. Then if there was a divorce or something happened, you were entitled to half, which is interesting. The United States actually, once discovering this was happening, protected them. It was really because of the Second Seminole Wars. And there's an excellent book that goes into depth about this called The Threshold of Manifest Death. Gender and National Expansion in Florida by Laurel Clark Shire. She's written a bunch of articles that you can access for free as well. One that I was able to find with no scholarly paywall, if that makes sense, from Project Views is The Rights of the Florida Wife, Slavery and U.S. Expansion and Married Woman's Property Law by her. She's the expert of this niche topic. When I'm doing my second person living history, I love talking about what she said because she's a very good at explaining not only white woman but free black woman because Florida itself had a fairly substantial free black population due to Spanish rule just because they had slavery under Spanish rule but it was a little bit easier to gain your freedoms underneath Spanish rules than it was in the United States and that's one of the reasons why a lot of enslaved people started escaping Florida and especially during the first Seminole War and you see this even with the second Seminole War one of the reasons it kept going was because of these southern plantation owners especially in Georgia and other places wanting to do a firm stand that quote unquote our property should not be escaping down to Florida and being protected by the Seminoles. That was a huge issue. You have to remember there's also a huge fear in the American South at this time with slave rebellions because of Nat Turner. That's another thing going on in the background during this time period. So she's really good at talking about the various different ethnic groups and how they're treated differently under the, um, the law. Free black women should be able to access these liberties as well. And you see in various court cases, that's not the case compared to white women who were able to get some property. And I'm not saying it was easy. There's a lot of cases she goes into depth discussing how a well-meaning cousin would start helping you and then make you sign a document that took over her entire estate and signing it over to him because she didn't know the legal jargon. And that was unfortunately a pretty common occurrence that was happening because if you're someone who is not trained in law, 
are understanding this, it's so easy for somebody that claims to be a loved one trying to help you out steal what you deserve under the that's something that's also interesting as well going back with this idea of woman being the home and that's the reason why the united states doubled down on these protections especially with the armed the occupation act the reason why that's happening is because they want especially white woman settlers coming down in this area and making homes, making Florida into a hospitable place. And you see time and time again in history, the West is the same way. You have to bring in the woman <laughs> or else it's, their colony is not going to work <laughs> um, for multiple different reasons. Women provide labor. They provide uh, children. They provide what is a homestead and making someone stay Duck, if that makes sense, compared to a military battalion that's going to move around. <laughs> I want to point out, it wasn't everyone starts divorcing <laughs> at this time period. It's just, A, divorce cases are really good at getting the documentation of seeing, oh, what are people viewing as property and how they're getting access to that. And not only that, the fact that there is more under American rule is important. But yeah, you would be destitute. And that's something that is the difference between the woman in the North, where a lot of these idea of woman having the right to property comes from the fact of husbands being awful and gambling away or drinking away or just putting in poor investment, which we especially see in the Jacksonian era with the land boom and the recession that happened. A lot of women were made destitute because their husband made some poor choices <laughs> that they had no way to prevent. Once you start, like New York, I think is, is one of the first states as well that starts allowing a married woman to own property. It was done for those reasons compared to the South, which Laurel Clark Shire points out is mainly due to, she thinks, colonization to make it more attractive to Florida and set up home here and do that. And unfortunately, kind of backfires because you don't have a huge, a bunch of women being like, heck yes, I want to live here in Florida where it's hot, it's swampy, and I may be killed by the Seminole. <laughs> this wasn't attractive. And what you usually see in, in divorce law is household goods being named as property because, again, that domestic realm, this is of the home, this is mine, I need this to make a home. And then you also see, unfortunately, enslaved people being chosen. And the reason why that is, is because that was a way for a woman, she could rent out those enslaved people to various other people and make money off of them. And that was a way of income for a woman to have where she would still be seen as respectable. One of those things where you have to remember the American economy driven by slavery and women are actively using enslaved people to be cons considered their property because they know that's going to be more profitable for them instead of the land, which is right now just land speculation at this time. That's important. And unfortunately, I think one of the things that has happened over the years is domestic history, because it was inherently feminine, has been viewed less than. And that's not the case. These women were basically keeping up the home and the family and making sure it's a side when you think of that's actually probably the most common form of history. Like, what do you remember? Not necessarily some days your day at work, but when you go home <laughs> and what do you do at your home? What are your friends? Who are those sort of things? And that whole domestic history is shoved aside, especially with the advent of, of technology that makes a lot of that easier, such as like the washing machine. <laughs> Laundry was a whole day thing. It takes a while. <laughs> it's important to recognize the contributions that women were doing within their communities and also not value it inherently less than because it was done by women. Just because the technology evolved where those jobs weren't as needed as much, allowing for women to have more and more free time, which eventually allowed them to go, go into the workplace. I guess like middle class, because women were always working. I want to point that out. Like you could make money as a pattern stitcher. You could make money weaving wool. All these things were ways that you can work in that time period, but it wasn't like societally acceptable. Cooking itself is it's an all 
all day thing. You have to remember, you can't just put on the oven. <laughs> um, you have to get the fire, kindle the fire, make sure the fire is at the right temperature. And that's an art in itself. You have to know roughly by just holding your hand up like, okay, it's 375 degrees. <laughs> um, or this is right. And how long I can cook it for? And how long do I have to tend the fire in order to cook it? So all these were important jobs in order to keep a community going. That's one of the things with the Industrial Revolution. A lot of the jobs disappeared. And these jobs, unfortunately, you could pay it outside of the house, but inside of the house, they were never essentially paid for all this labor that they were doing. It was, well, you're protected if you get married. <laughs> now, at the end of the day, you're not really protected because your husband could whittle away, all, spend all of your money because he made a couple of bad investments, which makes Florida unique in the fact that you had some protections. And that would be a very attractive offer if I was somebody up in somewhere else and being like, oh, you know what? If you know, I marry my husband, I have some little protections if I knew that law. I might consider it, but I'm not sure the lack of AC... The fact that there's no real city areas, and if something happens to you, you're, you're kind of on your own, is the best way to put it <laughs> in rural Florida. You have to think about milling the flour <laughs> and getting the yeast and letting it rise. Even if you're not interested in the living history or how people did it in the past, it's also good to think about that today. How many steps does it take to get your sandwich when you go? Because it's not about assembling it. It's about like, oh, who's the bakery? How did the bakery get its bread? How did it get the flour? How did it get the wheat? And all those different steps that thanks to industrialization and such that we have it that we can really access things compared to in the past where you would have to be worried about it and wondering, okay, there may be, I have to grind my flour today or make flour today. These are things to think about. Oh, we have so much more free time now. <laughs> Pickling and curing. Preservation is important of your food. You're not going to have fresh food all the time, and you don't want to be eating spoiled food. <laughs> Unfortunately, domestic history has been put to the corner and to the side so much because of that reason of it's viewed as feminine, therefore inherently less, which is just not true. <laughs> um, and this is something to always kind of put into context when you're reading about these people and what they're doing. Who is the person behind them <laughs> making sure that they can do this work? And a lot of times you'll see a woman, whether it's a mother or a daughter or a wife, these women were keeping afloat. And unfortunately, their stories just aren't told as much. And that's one of the things that I hope that I can bring that these stories of women who keeping their estates and such had to face a lot and they had to kind of figure out what to do in order to just survive here in Florida. You can see that with a lot of the court records that are talking about divorce cases, because a lot of the times what the women are petitioned for, for what their half of the property is, is the things that they need and know how to work to survive. So it's the household goods, it's the family china, it's the iron and spoon and that sort of thing compared to just land. And that's also where it gets to like, what's interesting with both is it, it seems unfortunately that enslaved people were considered for both sides heated what they want because that was a status symbol that became because they could hire somebody out to do those tasks to give them more free time to do other things. If I, and when I say free time, I don't mean like, oh, they're watching TV. <laughs> I, all these things are things that what is free time is, is not what we expect today because <laughs> we have leisure time. It's not like I'm going to go and <laughs> watch my Netflix. It's probably like, oh, I finally take care and darn that sock that I needed to darn for a bit. So it's important to be all these groups of people working. I want to point out us having leisure time is not necessarily like, oh no, people in the past have it so hard. It says we have a different form of working than it was in the past. Most of our working is now industrialized. There's studies that have shown our productivity has gone through the roof since what it was due to the industrial revolution and the technological revolution that happens in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. We're now the most productive time in history when it comes to work, but work is viewed as a different thing because we're doing more tasks that aren't necessarily manual labor, but are feeling more mental labor. <laughs> Brigitte, we've talked about domestic work, but we haven't talked about the greatest challenge in the home, which is child rearing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, child rearing is also a full time job. <laughs> and you also have to take into consideration when this woman, if she's doing what society like, is pregnant as well. Going through that, and you have to remember there's fear of death. I think your risk of death in pregnancy goes up 20% each pregnancy you have. There was a wonderful where I read a diary discussing how a woman had her burial shawl underneath her bed right before she went into birth who was so afraid she was going to die. And she wanted to make sure that everything was ready in case she did die in, in childbirth. Do you have that also <laughs> hanging around all these women? Oh, like, oh gosh, having children is definitely what society expects of you, but you may die. <laughs> and then you have to think about what's going to happen to your husband and your children. And if your husband can take care of your children and usually see really fast that, that men just instantly get remarried in the past to take care of the children. Or sometimes they will even send their children out after the death of a wife to other families because they don't know how to take care of the child in a way that's best while working to provide that income. Because it really, to have a home, you need to have three different people <laughs> helping you. All these are important to recognize what women were doing and how they were making an impact that we tend not to think of. So... A lot of the times there are, especially in larger families, that there is usually a daughter who stays and takes care of the parents, especially as they age. Interestingly enough, we're starting to see that trend actually come back because of how long, how much older we're able to live now. (laughs) And we're seeing people once again trying to take care of. And that, that would happen. So with single woman, the expectation to get married is big, but it wasn't like you're a horrible person if you don't get married. As long as you kept within the societal structures of I am helping my family and I am helping my home. And that's a big thing. If you are part of that domestic realm, you're going to be viewed as a good woman, if that makes sense. <laughs> but the moment you start going out in that public realm, and there's ways that you can do it, and you start seeing women, especially in the 1830s, playing around with these ideas of how to do it, whether it's working in a factory to earn extra money or selling what you may have had in your cottage industry. Those are definitely factors that you're still a standing citizen. But you also see religion. The 1830s had this second great awakening, which was this religious movement that focused on one's spiritual connection to to God. And what you start seeing with this movement is actually a lot of women get really involved with it. This is more up north, but you do see some of it trickling down to Florida in the south where you have women feel like it's my moral obligation to make sure that the men around me are good, upstanding Christian citizens because I have this personal connection to God. And so you start seeing religion viewed as the domestic realm because you have to teach it to kids. And that's reflected also in Europe with European art. You have this style um, of art over in Germany called Biedermeier, which was actually named after a character. And it's very, in my eyes, like very saccharine, if that makes sense. So you have... Especially if you look at, like, like Peter Fendi is one. He was one of these Biedermeyer artists. The art that he was paid for was mainly these images of women. They're praying with their, they're teaching their children how to pray. They're doing things at the home. Their husband has come from the hunt. All these things that show what is the ideal feminine <laughs> at this time period. And so as church becomes more involved, that this is part of the home, you start seeing women kind of press, like, okay, if, if church is part of the home, I can proselytize a little bit. Or in, in you definitely see that happening at this time period and with the second great awakening especially so i I think famous i don't remember what the quote was but there was a guide talking to these preachers how they have to be worried because a lot of the times this was the first time a woman could speak intellectually if she put it in context of her relationship of god and her feelings and what she thinks and that's her personal philosophies and if you're talking to her in a manner that you're almost having a salon like atmosphere there was a warning to preachers that sometimes the woman might throw themselves to you. <laughs> and you might have to worry about that. Famously, Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother got in trouble for that. He uh, turned out he was um, uh, seeing other women on the side as they were having intense spiritual conversations. <laughs> Brigitte, we've talked about domestic work, but we haven't talked about the greatest challenge in the home, which is child rearing. The 
1930s is the time period in American history where we drink the most. <laughs> so we drank almost, what, three times what the national average is today in 1830s. <laughs> and, and again, this is drinking culture was hugely important to America because it was an important part of creating public spaces. For women, if you don't have the right to access property as a married woman, your husband could drink away all of your money. Not only that, you have you have the Industrial Revolution. So in the cities, you have these jobs where you're dealing with major machinery. So if you get drunk on the job, you can die. And that's another thing where, oh, no, husband has lost all the money because he died because <laughs> he was drunk on the job. And you see the argument, especially in this early period, the argument being, especially in the South, you see this, not necessarily as much in the North. The North is trying to, because you have these intellect circles, especially in Boston and in Seneca, you're seeing more the, I like, we deserve this as women. We should have equal rights because as women, we were humans. Um, but down in the South, they make this argument mainly that, if we are supposed to take care of the home, we can't do that unless we have a voice that allows us to talk about alcoholism and prevent alcoholism happening. And so this is the time period where teetotaling starts becoming more and more popular. Prohibition starts being talked about that we should do these things because a blight on our society. These are all important things women have to worry about with alcohol consumption. And you see them going to... I think in the in the second summer wars they used to have rum rations and then and then it changed to just coffee and sugar. <laughs> so one vice for another vice. <laughs> But caffeine, caffeine's a little bit better <laughs> on the liver, not necessarily on the heart, but, <laughs> and you get temperance. It's holding this idea that with the Spanish laws that married women could own pretty, that is their own. It's also striking down, this is the idea that we want specifically white women to come here and settle and have land here and stay in these areas where the Seminoles are located because it's, we need to start moving. We need to have a reason why we're doing this. You have to remember the second some awards were pretty unpopular. Uh, it was a long war. It was expensive. <laughs> and especially near the end of it, there was discussion of human rights. I think famously, the bloodhounds that were being set caused a huge uproar from people like, okay, this is too far. We may not necessarily believe that the Native Americans should have the same rights as we do, but sending bloodhounds is a bit much. Uh, <laughs> so with this, it's being like, well, we have to have a reason why we're pushing to the state. The Armed Occupation Act makes it easier to have that, makes it easier to have people go down in that area and settle there and make a home, make it kind of appealing for women. And you do see some people do it. It doesn't go as planned. I've seen cases where a lot of the times land that's done in a woman's name may be somebody who comes from a wealthier family and uh, they want to make sure that their daughter keeps some money after she gets married <laughs> to somebody. So it's, she's not even in Florida. She's up to, out somewhere, but she's technically holding on to this land because it's a way for the wealthy to <laughs> uh, keep the money in the family. It's like today, <laughs> there's certain things you can access if you have enough money. <laughs> um, I would like to do some research, to see, especially with diaries of this time period, talking about, oh, I had to get the gun today and I was worried, and then it turned out it was just a giant hog or something. <laughs> but to show, oh, both parties have to be armed and ready to go to protect the home. Are you going to be doing things that are considered at that time period more masculine? Or was that up to your husband to take care and defend? Uh, and that's something that I would, would love to see more research on. One of the things that's interesting is when you have an attack, especially on women and children, most people are like, that's awful. And this immediately paints the seminals of, you know, these are really bad people. <laughs> they killed both the women and children of, of these plantations. It's great propaganda for the United States Army because you see these images floating around and it shows, oh my gosh, maybe war is right. It's a right and just war that we have to keep on doing this because you're going to just keep on killing the women and children. And that's not right. They're innocent bystanders in this. They're not military combatants. And that's important. Like, that's horrifying to think, oh, they're just going to kill 
anyone. I wanted to circle back. It wasn't because the Seminoles were bloodthirsty, awful people. No, it's because of that reason that they're making a home in, in that land and they know what that means. They're trying to send a symbol of, please get off. We're willing to risk it all and even kill women and children for this. But of course, it's not interpreted that way. It's interpreted like, yeah, this is a just war because these people are awful. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's awful and it's a nervous reaction. Brigitte, we're almost out of time. What would you like to add? I don't really have much. Just other, I appreciate guy what you're doing because I do believe that the Seminole Wars just in general is war just barely talked about. And a lot of different ways it shaped how warfare was fought in the United States. It shaped the ideas of America going forward. And it's one of these pieces of history that isn't as glamorous. It's complicated. It's messy. It's kind of conflicted in a sense, but it's really important. And I'm really thankful that I was able to be on the show and kind of talk about it because, as you can see, it had a great effect on the state of Florida in general. I do hope that more scholarship will eventually come out about this period of time in Florida history. I'm the curator of the Sanford Museum in Sanford, Florida. We are a free museum, so if you're ever in the area, I would love to see anybody who wants to come in. And we're open nine to five Tuesdays through Saturdays. So I wanted to do a little bit of plugging for my institution <laughs> while I'm on here. And we would be happy to see you. Also, since you're in the area, you should also go see Bennett's Museum, which is a museum of county history. But you do have to pay a charge for that museum. I think it's like $3.14. Break the back there, but we're free. <laughs> Uh, our website is, since we're um, managed by uh, the city, it's sanfordfl.gov. If you go to sanfordfl.gov and look underneath the recreation tab, you will find the museum and we'll be right there. And then you can only also, if you have any questions, email us at sanfordmuseum at sanfordfl.gov. Brigitte Stevenson, once again, thank you for joining us for the Seminole Wars. Well, thank you so much for having me on here. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden. Roast them, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.